we're coming into this compound and the initial alpha team goes through, goes over, and they're starting to set up security. So I, I come in about middle of the stack and I flow in and over towards the far end of the of the compound because I know I have to put up my radio whip all the way due to the fact of, again, so much, uh, so much iron content in the soil, communication problems and stuff. You had to put up your, your long whip, you know, so it's like a 15 foot antenna. So then I had just sent everything up and I'm looking back at the rest of the patrol flowing in and there was guys going up onto the rooftop, which was specialist Will Ross and uh, specialist Jason Johnston. You know, it was like right at one point and all of a sudden just boom, and a dust cloud just washes over. Welcome to Heroes Behind Headlines. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. Our guest today is William Yeski, a former sergeant in the U.S. Army whose powerful new book, Damn the Valley, is an honest and raw account of his deployment from 2009 to 2010 with 1st Platoon Bravo Company 2-508 Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne, in the Argandab River Valley in Afghanistan, known to them as the Meat Grinder, an enduring Taliban stronghold that had claimed the lives of foreign troops as far back as Alexander the Great and as recently as the Soviet Army. It's a story of brave young men placed in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, trying their best to advise and assist their Afghan counterparts, and at the same time maintain their own spirit and discipline, despite temperatures vacillating from wicked cold to mind-numbing 120 plus degree heat, the threat of IEDs on every inch of terrain they patrolled, and no clear strategic objectives. If you want to know what combat in Afghanistan was really like, what it was like to serve in a company where half of the men received Purple Hearts, and when they returned home were left to struggle with the numbing and psychologically debilitating after effects on their own, stay tuned. The author of the must-read Damn the Valley is with us today. It's my great honor to welcome William Yeski as today's Hero Behind the Headlines. Heroes Behind Headlines with Ralph Pizzullo. William, thank you so much for doing this, and congratulations on your book. It's great, very gritty and vivid. really gives you a sense of what it was like to serve in the Argandab. Is that the the way you pronounce it? Valley? The Argandab River Valley. Wow. And I mean, it's it's been my pleasure to bring the stories out there. I mean, I know some of them can get a little little dicey. I know that I've had a few people, either ones that were there, you know, I'd said, man, I, I had to portion out some of these things when I had went through them, yeah. you know, and some of the people that, um, you know, were family as well. Yeah. Oh, it must be rough for them. Yeah. That was one of the things with writing this and, and wanting to stay respectful, but also putting forward that, that true picture. Let's go back and just, if you would talk for a minute about your background and your decision to enlist and what you were thinking and then what that experience was like. Absolutely. I enlisted a little bit later than most. I enlisted at 26 and that was due to, you know, I had been thinking about going into the military, specifically the Marines at 18, you know, just out of high school. Mm -hmm. And I was convinced by the, the parents, you know, at the time they were like, Hey, we'll, we'll pay for college, you know, and this was pre-war. We weren't at war at the time Yeah, that came. Matter of fact, I remember specifically where I was, you know, that was, I was in college at the time, you know, they had convinced me, Hey, we'll, we'll pay for your schooling. And then have our blessing. If you still want to do military after, you can have our blessing Mm -hmm. uh, to go forward. And and that way you'll be eligible to be an officer as well. I was like, hey, that's not a bad idea. You know, okay. Sure. Yeah. And right around, uh, I want to say it was my second year, my sophomore year, was when 
you know, I was down in the cafeteria and everybody started crowding around the TV and they're like, Oh, have you seen this? And it was, it was yeah. the towers and class was canceled for the rest of the day. And we're all kind of just down there looking at this, like, you know, knowing that something pivotal just happened. Right. Right. But yeah. trying to grasp exactly, yeah. you know, I mean, you could see, uh, so I was, I grew up in Connecticut. You could see the smoke from New York. Mm -hmm. So just wild to be in that proximity of what just happened. And yeah, no, everybody's lives changed. Oh yeah. Massively, massively. Like the whole world has shifted Yeah, and it won't be the same after this. And that's kind of what, uh, you know, I didn't, I still had that pull, mm -hmm. but I was like, let me get through this hurdle. And at that time, you know, I had kind of like the rest of America, you know, if you really think about it, we, I'd sort of moved on. I was racing cars. I was, um, you know, going towards that end of, at first with BMW and then with Subaru doing rally racing <laughs> at the time. Uh, but it, it was really a, a life instance to where everything kind of came to a head. And I was like, I need to hit a reset button. And yeah. the military was always something that I wanted to do. It was something that held purpose and giving back to something that was larger than myself. Mm -hmm. And that's really the reason why, you know, I went down and I said, Hey, this is, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go on a special forces contract. And, mm -hmm. you know, that held airborne and that was a mm -hmm. means to an end on there. Yeah. And I yeah. ended up in the, in the 82nd airborne. <laughs> wow. And you deployed to Afghanistan in 2009. Is that correct? Yes. September, 2009 was our, our first rip out. Like I know we, I had gotten there in uh, December, 2008. Uh -huh. It was, you know, literally a week until they went into their training cycle and their training cycle, the way that they trained that brigade and that battalion, it didn't stop. Yeah. You know, it just went, as soon as you got there, it was um, ITC, which was intensive training cycle. And then it went into, you know, there was a, a few months of that. And then JRTC down in uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then it was, all right, you got a month left and you're, you're going to the, going to Afghanistan. And that's just how it was. Yeah. Very kinetic yeah. at the time. Yeah. And when did you arrive in Kandahar? So we, oh man, cause you have to think of the route over there. You know, you end up in Kazakhstan first and then that's kind of where they stage everything. And then you go into Kandahar airfield is, mm -hmm. we ended up there. So I want to say it was the second or third week in September. Okay. And it's huge, Kandahar Air Base. Oh, massive. You know, they had actually, <laughs> at the time, it was just building up larger and larger. And yeah, they had this, yeah. this boardwalk on there with like a, a Burger King and a Pizza Hut. And we're like, what is this? <laughs> but it was just weird. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who don't know Afghanistan, uh, Kandahar is sort of the, the capital of the South, I would say, and kind of the gateway to, uh, Pashtun territory, which is the tribe that sort of supports the Taliban. The Taliban is sort of the armed wing of the Pashtun tribe or the radical wing of the Pashtun tribe. So you're kind of thrown right into the enemy territory right away. And there was definitely, when you got into the Kandahar region, there's definitely a lot going on. So it was strange because we came into CAF. Mm -hmm. This whole mission was this, the start of, you know, we had originally been slated for Iraq. Uh -huh. And this was a, hey, we need more people for an advise and assist in Afghanistan. So we were literally signed off on with executive orders from President Obama. And when we got into Afghanistan, quite honestly, nobody knew where to put us. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So we, yeah. So we ended up in Helmand province first. Yeah. Try, trying to get into the Battle of Marja with the Marines and um, the British forces that were there. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't working out. They didn't want us anywhere near that end. And they kind of gave us this, hey, well, you know, why don't you take this end of the highway? You know, it was just us away from everything. And we're like a whole lot of what you would see in your typical type deployment. You know, it was a lot of hurry up and wait. Yeah. A lot of uh, wide open desert regions and you know, as long as you cleared, you know, painstakingly cleared the culverts along the way down the highway, um, you would be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't anything nuts. Yeah. And it was really our battalion commander trying to get these guys that have been highly trained, ready for the fight. Yeah, sure. You know, he, he went to General Crystal and was like, hey, I have these guys, they're not being utilized right. Do we have anywhere we can put them? Mm -hmm. 
And then that's how we ended up in the Argonaut River Valley come, come December. Can you describe a little bit the history? Because this, this river valley has got a strong military history. Oh, yes, it does. Yeah, no. So you would even, if you want to go back to the most recent, you know, that was the Russians. Yeah. You know, in the 80s. And one of the wildest things is as you're patrolling through this valley, seeing, you know, there was Russian heavy drop shoots that people were using as either an awning or a nomadic tent. <laughs> um, you know, and you you would see the occasional local wearing, you know, an older uh, local man wearing a Russian officer belt. Wow. You know, and there's only one way you get those. The, the, yeah. I mean, the valley was just full of people that, you know, it was ex Mujahideen. Yeah. They had been, they have lived, lived this, you yeah. know, their whole life. Yeah. And prior to the Russians, you have the British. Yeah. You know, and they had a hell of a time in the valley. Before that, you have Alexander the Great. I mean, this stuff just goes crazy. It just goes back and back. It, yeah. You know, there's empires that have had issues in these valleys and it's right. The terrain is not good for it. And really, it's the perfect spot to to run an insurgency from. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the topography of the valley a little bit? Yeah. Because I know it's very dramatic. And also the temperature changes, which are... Uh, oh, man. <laughs> insane. <laughs> I mean, you talk one time, it was like 142 degrees yep. outside. I can't... I mean, a hundred and I've been in 120, and you can barely breathe. I mean, but 145, yeah. I can't even imagine. Well, so that was in Helman province okay. to where it, it reached those like top, you know, just crazy. But the, the valley would hit, you'd hit 120, you'd hit, yeah. definitely hit 110. But the, the difference there is that at night, you know, the temperature drop would go down into like in the valley, man, you'd hit points to where it'd be like the 60s or the 70s. And you're like, oh, that's not too bad. But then when you're talking 120 during the day and that <laughs> drop of 50 degrees and you're yeah. shivering, yeah. you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's only 70 degrees yet. I'm frozen to the bone here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. What is the topography like? It looks like it's, you know, very dry, dusty. That again, that's all, that's all Hellman. So oh, okay. the Argandab was, yeah, the Argandab was very different. So it, behind me here, I have a picture with these mountain ranges back there. It looks like a lot of planting and farms and so on. And yeah. So what you're seeing in this picture though, is that this is winter time yeah. in there. So that's why it's looking more desolate and whatnot. In the spring, mm -hmm. that valley comes to so much life in the all of the fields surrounding the area, the farmers all have like this crazy system of shared irrigation that they work on. It's really ingenious. These guys are, I would love to see what a group of Afghans, like in the Midwest, they probably make a paradise out of the place. It's, <laughs> it's nuts. Just the, the old school farming techniques and what they can get by with, right. um, as well as the ingenuity to do so. It's, so the whole valley will come up during the spring, there's like pomegranate orchards in there that go into full bloom. Wow. It's beautiful place. Yeah. But the fact is, is that we were going against, you know, not only would they, they were masters at hiding landmines and they would really, they would use in talking with the EOD teams, which is the explosives ordinance guys that see this and they see these tactics used on a day to day. Yeah. But to where they would actually use terrain pieces and use the way the sunlight came in on you. And stuff like hunting type techniques wow. to draw your human eyes yeah. to a certain point to where they'd have IEDs hidden and hidden below. They actually knew because um, they would use, they would stagger charges to use like a remote detonation one that was higher, but the main charges being lower to where you couldn't actually tell with a uh, mind detector. Wow. Tricky, tricky people. Yeah, it sounds that way. And they've been doing this for, as you say, their whole lives. Their been whole fighting. life. Yeah. yeah. I guess to a certain extent, it becomes just sort of like a normal part of their life that they're going to have some foreign army in their valley and they're going to resist them like any way they can. And they they know that IEDs are, are sort of their best method of harassing a, a better equipped military. Yeah. It, it was with us for, for sure. You yeah. Know, I mean, that was, they knew without a shadow of a doubt, you know, that they weren't, they weren't getting anywhere as far as a direct action type thing. Yeah. They saw the writing on the wall. They had heard about the stuff we did in Helmand. 
you know, and we hear across the radios, yeah. you know, out in Helmand province, it was a, hey, circle squares are coming out, like back off, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We, yeah. we tear them up, you know, that's, so I, you can't really blame an enemy like that to where it's like, hey, this is the smarter way to go. Let's just pull back and, and watch this happen. It was just the flow of insurgents that were coming in, in and out of the area. So, I mean, you had to deny movement by putting out in these different belts and stuff around Kandahar to try to create, you know, security within the city center. Yeah. Uh, because you have things like when, when they pulled out, it was a very short time before the city was taken right back over yeah. after we were gone. A lot shorter than projections had even put out there. But that's just because, I mean, when you have an enemy entrenched in that and they, you, know, you could see it within the valley, it wasn't every town, but like the further we went along, you know, we were finding that the epicenter really of where a lot of this stuff was coming from and a lot of the conflict was coming from was the little town of uh, De Cache. Yeah on the far end. So the towns that were closer to, you know, our initial um, emplacement, which was Cop Ware, mm -hmm. you know, it was pretty central within the valley. And then Cop Johnston, which was closer to where the bazaars and uh, markets and stuff that were on the main road, but it was kind of cutting off that heavily populated area from getting by there you know, mm -hmm. without being eyes on scene somehow. Yes. Yeah. You know, when you, when we started having incident after incident, suicide bombers, you know, and it just seemed that there was a belt of IEDs almost around that town, mm -hmm. you know, that's where your issue is coming from. And that's where we ended up, you know, one of the platoons ended up basically uh, being within, you know, dwelling within that town, establishing a, an outpost out of one of the villagers houses, you know, and that, that one, that's where the cover picture came from. So let's talk about these fire bases. Nothing was really established in that valley. Okay. Like H HQ was up in an area, it was called the OCCD. I don't really talk about that in this, in this book, but you can see where it is. I, I put one of the grid maps up on the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So I mean, anywhere there, it's just damn the valley book on all of them. But there's a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, it's almost a year of daily posting on there. So I mean, it might get... <laughs> pushed in the background of things, but there's a map up on there and you can kind of see to where Johnston was a small Afghan checkpoint. Mm -hmm. So that cutting off the main road and they let, we left one of our platoons there as kind of a QRF, mm -hmm. you know, quick reaction force. And if anything went wrong with our assault and with taking, you know, that area by force and it was literally, we came down into what was established as cop where, but there's uh, two other villages that are close nearby there. There's uh, Pier Pamal, which is up by the mountainside. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of the name of the other. Bibi Hawa was the one that we were closer to. Uh -huh. And we essentially came across, okay, what's, what's central? What do we have some standoff with? Where are we not going to be like in an actual valley, but we can still have one of our OPs up on the mountain look over us. Mm -hmm. And we established Cop Ware in the middle of a radish fields you know it was basically oh. yeah push out security and in a few days a convoy came in with uh, a truckload of hescos and some other stuff and dropped it and they were like all right guys good luck good luck <laughs> and that's it that was it you know i mean we everything was brought in via sling load from the helicopter because it was too dangerous to have uh continual convoys coming in and out right and cop johnston was built out once they kind of realized, hey, you know, where is small enough to where well, it was big enough to where we needed two platoons at first. Mm -hmm. and, but then the amount of people that we had augmented with us. And then eventually we actually had uh, Afghan police and Afghan army mm -hmm. staying in there. So it was a joint type compound. You know, it just kept developing over time very rapidly. Yeah. And so you're picking these strategic points where you've got uh, some strategic advantage in terms of the topography, and then you're setting up these fire bases, basically. And they're small, right? I mean, I saw the pictures <laughs> yeah. of Johnson. I mean... Johnson is 28 uh, guys at one time on that thing. Yeah. I mean, it was... It's kind of a wild uh, concept. And describe the conditions, because you, you talk about that in the book. You know, everything was, everything's difficult. Like, showers are difficult. Going to oh, the yeah. bathroom is difficult. Um, <laughs> 
Well, that was especially cop where in the beginning was horrible for that. Like we, I hated that place. Yeah. I hated it just because there was, there was so much to do mm -hmm. in the way of when you, it's not like when you're kids out in the woods, you yeah. know, and it's, you can Hey, go we're going to set up a little spot, you know, it's right. No, I, you know, we have, we're already automatically, you know, you have to establish patrols in that area and yeah. establish a presence and like yeah. actually push out your security. But then you have to fill, you know, these base defenses, like these HESCOs that were around there, which is, you know, it's a wireframe with burlap on the inside to where you can, you put dirt in it. Yeah. But we were guys with shovels out there. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> the first sergeant had started a work party and I mean, w there was three guys on, a HESCO at all times, like trying to fill this 24 hours out of the day. Yeah. And within three days, they finally filled one. I mean, it was just like, wow, how is this even, you know, and it was thing after thing plus guard tower. Like you were run yeah, so ragged that like, honestly, there's not much of cop wear in that book just because a lot of it is blanked out of my head. Yeah. Just so much work. Because you're basically just sent out into this valley and told to build a base. Yeah. And then patrol the, <laughs> the valley at the same time. Yeah. Right. A lot of times you just feel like you're out there flapping. Yeah. Will emphasizes that Damn the Valley is not just his personal story. It was written for and with the men of Bravo Company 2-508 to establish a record of their deeds and actions on the battlefield over 10 years ago. It's a chapter in some people's lives that they would rather forget than carry forward. He spoke to more than a dozen of the men he served with. Some were happy to hear from him. Some cursed him initially and called back three months later with jokes and stories. Others didn't want to be mentioned because they didn't want to bring back bad memories to haunt them again. All of them that served together during those years in the Argandab River Valley were affected in some way. As one of Will's colleagues, retired Sergeant Major Bert Puckett wrote, quote, we all left a piece of ourselves there. Can you talk about what the patrols are like? Because as you say in the book, they're really clever their big weapon is defensive weapon of the IEDs, and they're really clever in terms of where they plant these so that they're going to be along all the trails. They're going to be at all the junctions. You had to watch everything. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact of, like, we, we had to, we had to change up our patrol habits. You know, it wasn't like where you're normally in your standard uh, infantry style wedge. Mm-hmm we had to switch over to single file, you know, just because of, we weren't worried too much about direct contact in that way. Yeah. It was, Hey, stay in the guy's footsteps in front of you. Right. So if you go into the first large IED, you know, that the first IED we came across with specialist Jason Johnston. Yeah. I myself had literally stepped over this IED or the initiator for the main charge you know, maybe 30 seconds prior to it being stepped on, you know, and going off. Can you talk about that one in detail? How many people were on patrol? And as you say that you go out single file and is there a guy in the front with a mind detector of, of any sort? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we would run and I'm trying to think of because the patrols would vary. Um, I want to say in the beginning, they were a little bit larger there. So that was anywhere from a 12 to 14 on that one. Mm-hmm. And that one was with third squad. So that was Sergeant Alan Thomas and his team leaders were a uh, specialist, Alan Culp and um, Sergeant James Lee, as he might've been corporal at the time, but they, I can't remember if they gave him his stripes when he first got to company uh, or uh, when we first got overseas. But um, Culp was up front running with the mine hound actually. And there was an EOD team with us at the time as well, which I think consisted of two or three guys. And the mission was to get over overwatch over a suspected bomb maker's compound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're out there and we did, we had done kind of a presence patrol and then rolled back into where we were going to be doing this. And it wasn't that far off of where cop Ware was. Mm -hmm. And 
you come in and the way that these compounds are done, there's orchards surrounding it. And then there's an outer courtyard kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you come in and then there's the, the walled off actual compound. So you come into there. So it's like a compound within a compound almost. So you're going into the main section and, you know, the first part went over it. EOD cleared it, you know. Now, EOD, these are the mine clearance teams. Yes, explosive ordnance disposal. Okay. And what do they have? They have metal detectors. They have... Depends on... It depends on who you're with. It depends on mission set. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're explosives... Uh, you know, on that end, they're the experts on that. I know a few yeah. guys that went that route, you know, and two with talking with, uh, you know, one of them that and he's actually still in, but I mean, he's essentially seen the entire playbook. He was in, yeah. I think his initial year was 99. So he's seen the progression of IEDs throughout. Yeah. And it was really neat in writing this to talk to him, like, Hey, where were we in this order of things? And like, where, what did we see? Right. And, and it wasn't that the fact they weren't complex minds and that's where it was like the emplacement of this stuff was complex. So like the one that I'm talking about in particular, like right here where we came in, the portion to where you initiated the main charge that you stepped on, the metal that was in there was no bigger than the size of a pin. Wow. And like, we're talking like a sewing needle pin. No kidding. Wow. So to, to find something that size, especially in an area where we also had issues within the soil out there with having a high iron ore content. Okay. Yeah. There's no something that small. And then what they had done was they daisy chained it up into the wall with the large charge. Yeah. So you would never think to sweep the wall initially. Ah, I see. So you're looking at the ground. You're looking at the ground. Yep. And you're looking for something the size of a pin. Yeah. That's so, crazy. And that's, and that, that's buried. You yeah. Know? So, I mean, you're not actually going to, and it didn't matter on how much you, essentially those mine hounds and the mine finders, there was guys that kind of figured out a pattern to what was happening and like what they were looking for in it. Number one, this was so early yeah. on. Yeah. And number two, even uh, with how some of those guys were, some, some of them just learned a certain signs to look for, which is really the main thing was to stay, I guess, stay frosty. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. They're almost like scouts. So they're almost like in, yeah. Yeah. Indian well, when, scouts. They, yeah. when these yeah. guys moved to tripwires and stuff and to like, you know, there was like range distancing flags that these guys would put in trees and where you would just think was, you know, maybe a, a piece of something that somebody got snagged you know, on whatnot, they're actually sizing you up for exactly where the patrol is within things. They, it was no joke. Like they it's a had it down to a science. Sophisticated thing, almost like an art. And the dogs are in your book, the dogs were of, you know, like not, I mean, they were great to have around, but not much use. The official military dogs, there was a few, they found a few and stuff. It was almost like the local dogs, like were <laughs> picking up on more. It was so crazy. It was weird. Like we actually had one of them, uh, the one I talked about in there, Bowser. Yeah. Um, he found charges on more than one instance. Hmm. You know, it was, yeah, it was just weird. Like he would, you know, pawn at something and there's like debt cord in the ground. And you're like, yeah. what the heck? Yeah. They just <laughs> could sense it. That's incredible. Yep. So we're flowing, we're coming into this compound and the initial, you know, the alpha team goes through, goes over and they're starting to set up security. So I, I come in about middle of the stack and I flow in and over towards the far end of the, of the compound. Cause I know I have to put up my radio whip all the way mm -hmm. due to the fact of, again, so much. Uh, so much iron content in the soil, communication problems and stuff. You had to put up your your long whip, you know. So it's like a fifteen foot antenna, mm -hmm. no matter where you would go to be able to get communications. And I had just sent everything up, and I'm looking back at the rest of the patrol flowing in, mm -hmm. and there was guys going up onto the rooftop, which was Specialist Will Ross and uh, Specialist Jason Johnston, and it was. You know, it was like right at one point and all of a sudden just boom and a dust cloud just washes over. Yeah. And that's when I, you know, I got on the radio and I was like, they didn't even 
believe it just because it was all I got in was I'm like, hey, this is yes, we just hit an IED. Yeah. You know, I know we have guys that are urgent surgical. Yeah. I don't know how many yet. Right. Just start spinning them up. Yeah. You know, and that's when I came in, uh, went towards where the guys were that were hit. You know, I, number one to find the lieutenant to let him know, hey, this is they know that we've been hit. They're on the way. Yeah. At which time Lieutenant Demarest was, hey, you're EMT trained, you're EMT qualified. I've got the radio from here. He took the radio and I went into treatment of um, specialist uh, Towery, which was the one who had hit the initial one. He lost his foot right off the bat. You know, they call that a toe popper, yeah. you know, but it took, took his leg from uh, below the knee. But it also, I mean, he lost some fingers. Every, everybody was very rocked by that one that was in that immediate vicinity. The, sure. That charge, the main charge was meant to be a squad killer. Oh, wow. And so if, if Johnston wasn't exactly where he was when that thing went off, uh, it very possibly could have killed quite a few more mm -hmm. during that. So, I mean, it's a tragedy on what happened to him. Yeah. You know, he was blown over the wall and was essentially, uh, you know, really almost cut in half. You know, his, one of his legs was gone. One of them was still there, but to where the charge went up and in, there was really nothing left. I was completely surprised on how someone was still cognizant and still talking to us. And to experience that, I mean, you know, the guy's going to die and you're seeing what's left of him and you're actually talking to him. Yeah. And that was my thing like when we got out there and eventually got up to him you know uh doc had gone out first so he'd been out there for maybe two minutes or so mm -hmm. so when i came up you know he's stuffing him full of curl x and he's trying he's doing whatever he can do you know to, yeah. to cling on to that chance yeah you know maybe we'll see if i can just get him to when the birds get here yeah you know we'll see what happens yeah and you know it was a what what can I do? And him looking at me and just being like, just talk to him. Yeah. Just be there with him. Yeah. You know, I'll let you know anything else. And that for me was a, that was tough. I bet. You don't think about it at the time, you know, but then afterwards, the gravity of everything that had happened. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's like what, nothing could have been done differently, but you think about that. You know, that's what you think of is, was that the best way, I guess, for someone to spend their last moments on this earth. Yeah. Was he aware of what had happened to him or how bad the injuries were? So he actually had me, you know, he had asked me to check over, you know, he was wondering if, um, really one of the things that most of the guys ask, especially with an IED underneath you is, is my penis intact? Yeah. You know, and he had asked like, how bad is it? You know? And I'm like, you're missing a leg, man. But you know, one's pretty mangled. Yeah. And that was the next thing is, Am I still there? Right. You know, and it was the, you know what? I'll, I, I got, you have to look at that point. Yeah. You know? it's, yeah. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's not looking good, but at the same time, you're still there. You're going to be fine. Yeah. Wow. Was he the only casualty? And I know there were other serious injuries. Um, so in that incident, he was the only, he was the only one that was killed. Yeah. You know, you had, um, I mean, doc even had shrapnel to the face and was, was working half blind actually at that point. <sighs> Wow. You had, uh, I know Will Ross, they evac'd him just because of his proximity to the, to the mine. He came back out though, mm -hmm. a few days later. Wow. And then, uh, one of the gunners, Adam Volker, uh, he had shrapnel to the face and ear damage and some other stuff as well. I mean, just these, and he came back as well. I mean, everybody came back other than, uh, you know, Towery, yeah. which was missing a leg and stuff. Johnston, which, you know, went forward. Wow. And how do you deal with that as a group? Because you were only a small group of guys, 28 guys. Well, that, so on where really you could go by platoons. So, I mean, you're looking at, I think at that time, because when, when we got down to 28, man, that was, I mean, we were severely under strength at that point, mm -hmm. but I want to say we were mid thirties, okay. like, uh, probably 38 at that point. Yeah. You know, and you're, you're with one of the other platoons too, but really, you know, this, this was, we were so separate. Yeah. The platoons were so tight internally to where 
it was kind of strange the way that they ran uh, they ran the company, but it worked to where everybody was always in a competition. So, I mean, it really pushed forward some, yeah. some, some excellence there. I mean, when you have a, a group of alphas like that yeah, sure, and stuff, sure. and Makes that's sense. how they sort of did We're going to be the best platoon. <laughs> We're going to show those guys. But coming back after that incident, you know, that night, you had some guys, you know, you know, you have to go out the next day, but yeah. you have some guys just breaking down over everything that just happened and, you know, leaning on one another. Yeah. And really just, I, you know, I mean, there were tears from yeah, some sure. of them. Sure. Uh, there was ang- anger expressed from some of them. Yeah. You know, yeah. and Johnson was always somebody who was a guy you could talk to. You know, he was always an open book about stuff. Yeah. So he was really friendly with a lot of them. Yeah. So at that time I was the RTO. Yeah. Yeah. So I switched over from a machine gunner when we were in Hellman's to a radio tele- telephone operator, which was really, this is what I wanted to do all along anyway. Mm-hmm. So for me to be able to get that job in the Valley was, you know, a, a plus in my side. Mm-hmm. Cause really that's what I wanted to do in special forces moving forward anyway, was being 18 echo. So that's a communication sergeant. Yeah. And that role is critical in a situation yeah. where you're out in the middle of a, a Valley in Southern Afghanistan. I mean, really, especially in a, in a modern day battlefield, it's even more so now with the, yeah. the technology and everything that they have now is wild to see the capabilities to talk to some of the the new guys but you're the you're the eyes and ears on the battlefield you know especially at that point if something happens and they don't have anybody on there there's there's nothing there's no eyes on they can only go off of what they hear either the the boom in the distance you know if nobody's communicating back all they can think is we're gone is everybody dead yeah you know or if you're bringing in yeah you're bringing in helicopters you're calling in medevacs you're you know, at one point I had to, um, we're getting shot at, you know, somebody tried to throw a grenade over a wall at us and we go into, you know, a straight contact mm-hmm. firefight situation. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the type of stuff to where you are, you have to be on it. And what kind of equipment in those days were you carrying? Just, just a radio <laughs> or what? <laughs> So I carried a few radios, but, yeah. uh, the, the main one was the man pack and that was the, the 117 golf. Mm-hmm. And that was the first era to where they, this thing would do both analog and digital channels. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would always run, you know, digital com and stuff on there. So s- security encrypted, but this was the next, you know, the golf was the next capability forward. They were moving to digital signal. It, it was, uh, supposed to reach out further you could actually plug in certain things and have like drone feeds come through or um they had a system at the time it's called tac chat which was essentially you know just a almost like a message board you know to where you had to know where you're linking into it and stuff and they're just typing out hey in contact at this grid or you know coming through this area or some commanders would use it as their personal message board but <laughs> <laughs> wow Wow. So you've got a keyboard as well. Uh, we never, they never wanted us to use that. And so okay. like, I kept bringing this stuff up with the commander. Like, I'm like, Hey, you know, when we're out there, like on a three day blocking position, we can, you know, we could use the drone feeds. We can have ISR. We can actually pull up yeah. satellite imagery that, you know, if they have anything in the last 24, we can see this. Yeah. And, uh, it was like, a, uh, we don't, you know, it's too new for me to, we don't need that. Oh, okay. Like it was sort of brushed aside. So, well, right. you have to think of the time too, you know, it's just another good idea. Yeah. And all of this is new and people are adjusting to the new technology and probably you're much more advanced than, than, than the commanders are. Right. I mean, which is natural. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he knew about some of it. It's just a, um, a fact of not being used to it yeah you know it's not anything that they used before and it's not something that they've integrated into the battle space yet i don't think anybody was using anything like that other than um special operations at the time so now let's talk about when you go on these patrols what kind of feedback are you getting from the civilians the people that you're encountering in these little villages and farming communities and how does that change over time yeah exactly that's where i was going to go into because at first you know, we are taking over for, um, the, you know, 117 Striker Brigade. And man, if you look at their posture towards people, towards the populace, they were on a search and destroy anti-guerrilla mission. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, they. Very I aggressive. mean, if you even extremely aggressive, that's all. Colonel Harry Tunnell. I mean, you can look. I don't go into the whole thing, but you can look up. Just type his name into you know Argandob yeah. Colonel Harry Tunnell, and you can see that it just was. It wasn't the right fight for that area. It wasn't the right fight for the time. Because if you look at one thing that Afghans do, you know, is they they will unite. They do this very well. They'll unite against the common enemy. Yeah. And if you are the common enemy, that's that was the whole point of uh, what was put out by doctrine from General David Petraeus. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the coin counterinsurgency. You're working by, with, and through. You're trying to win over the trust of this populace. So it's more the special forces philosophy. Oh yeah. No, foreign internal defense. That's exactly what it was. We were living amongst the populace. Mm -hmm. We were, you know, working by with and through their Afghan police force that was there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the ones that we were with at Johnson were really good. Yeah. And it essentially went from the people being very wary of us, you know, very guarded. I know the people down in the Akashi, you know, they were never, I don't think they really ever had sort of any sense of, hey, these are okay people. Yeah. That that area was just so indoctrinated to where it was not. Right. You know, those were the ones that were playing the the song of celebration after, you know, someone got blown up. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, some of these villages were very happy that we were patrolling out there and providing a presence and security at night because they would get dragged out of their homes and beaten up if they were seen talking to the U.S. Yeah. Kind of like the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War. Same kind of thing. The same stuff. Yeah. The same stuff. And that's like a lot of, you know, when I was in uh, middle school and high school, books were a lot of escape for me. Yeah. And I was really drawn to that era of warfare was Vietnam. Right. And to be experiencing that end and seeing (sighs) that end of it. Yeah. In person and going, this is the same thing. Right. You know, we're still stuck in the exact same situation here yeah you can't just walk into somebody's backyard so to speak and expect them to trust you within a couple weeks or a couple months especially if they're being watched by their neighbors and reported on yep will was a line soldier radio operator and a paratrooper like the other brave men in first platoon their mission was to hold the Argandab Valley and engage in counterinsurgency, or COIN, C-O-I-N, which focused on restoring or augmenting the capacity and legitimacy of the partner state, which in this case was the Afghan government. But as Will points out, the cultural gap between the Afghans and the American soldiers was huge. This was a country, after all, where females were considered subhuman. The local police and military were often unreliable and sometimes outright hostile. And bachi bazi, or boy play, was an accepted practice. It involved young boys who were dressed as females to perform dances in front of men at parties or events because females were forbidden from doing so. The boys were usually kidnapped from poor families, raped and degraded, and usually thrown away by the time they turned 18. One of the biggest things is too, is not only that, but then who's coming in after? Because yeah. they know that this rotation's only for so long. Right. Are, is, is the next group going to be like these guys? Or are they yeah. going to be like the guys before them to where we, you know, had to watch ourselves? Yeah. Wow. So a difficult, difficult job. Very. Psychologically, just trying to, to win these people over, like the hearts and minds aspect of it. I think that, you know, really genuinely, there's some really good people over there. Yeah. You know, there's, you're going to find that anywhere. Sure. Um, but it's just uncovering either who or, or proving to them that you're not, you know, that you're there for a reason that's actually honorable and right. You know, I talked about that in one, one thing, just as something as simple as the guys that they would contract out some of the local, local guys. So I would occasionally share some cigarettes with them, mm-hmm. you know, and they, they knew me as as whoosh because of the camel on the camel cigarettes. Uh, and that's Pashtun for camel is whoosh. Mm-hmm. And I hated the, the 
cigarettes that they had, they were terrible, but it was a way to gain a commonality with them. Mm -hmm. You know, local cigarettes in Afghanistan are these things called pines. They're disgusting. (laughs) (laughs) But one day we're out on patrol after we had, this is months later after, you know, this was back at cop where, and now we're fast forward summertime. Uh, We were running, you know, first platoon was now running out of cop Johnston. And we're on a patrol down by b- the bazaar yeah. um, near the Gondigan area in town. And I hear from across, you know, this, uh, this large, there's this big opening in between us. I hear whoosh. And I look over and there's that one of the guys that would trade cigarettes with her. Hey, hey, come here. Yeah. You know, and I bring him over and we talk for a minute, you know, in broken stuff. Yeah. But he essentially tells me, he's like, hey, there's some guys up ahead waiting over here on you guys just watch out yeah and i i tell the squad leader i'm like hey man like these guys are telling us and we went into a you know all right we're still going that way we're just going to do what's called a bounding overwatch in case we get into something like let's let's mess them up Mm -hmm. you know and they decided not to uh, attack on that day probably because they saw that yeah uh end of things but who who would have known you know if i didn't gain that between those people it would have, oh, that's just those guys you know who cares right so it's building trust creating relationships but like as we were talking about before like this is a long-term process yeah and one of the guys you meet in one of these villages turns out to speak he's an older guy who speaks english and went claims at least he went to <laughs> oxford the way he spoke and just how educated he was i wouldn't doubt it Really? You know? Wow. Yeah. Th- this was out on the grape fields on the far end um, near the town of Diakache, uh, by antenna checkpoint. There's a set of grape fields that was out there that you would have to cross. And you'd occasionally get shot at from the Afghan checkpoint because they wouldn't realize it was some U.S. that were running underneath. Mm. And um, it's, I guess it's a lucky thing that they were just a bad shot. <laughs> 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 let's not train those guys yeah <laughs> but we're out there one day and there's this older gentleman you know so of course the interpreter you know the uh lieutenant demarest is like hey get up here and he looks like everybody else beard yeah super old looking yeah 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 wearing the the band jams and um yeah we uh he goes to talk to him and the guy just in perfect it almost you know that scene in in star wars with uh ian oh man he's the guy who plays obi-wan yeah you know and it was just like that it was a it was an english accent to and everything just the, it just <laughs> was so weird just old guy that won't be necessary you know right <laughs> he just opens up and we start talking and we have a follow-on with him and that is where we ended up in his compound for a you know a, older people out there are revered so we were like all right this is either one way to speak to the elder or at least he knows who's in power in this area. We don't really have a, you know, this was up in Dikashi in the very beginning and try to establish who's who out here. Yeah. And it was maybe five minutes into this meeting when a suicide bomber goes off. That was outside where the other guys were, you know, they had a, a three-way intersection. They were blocked off and they were yeah. patting people down that were coming through. And a suicide bomber decided to attack at that point. And that's when, you know, Sergeant Thomas was hit in the chest with a uh, ball bearing or two and specialist Will Ross almost lost his shoulder. I mean, if they said that if it was a, the smallest bit of distance off, like his whole shoulder would have separated. Yeah. So not only do you have to watch the road and look for these little friggin' needles, yep. which are impossible to see. Now we have human. Because anybody can be a suicide bomber. Yeah. And that's the reason where they would use them. Yeah. It didn't stop there either. I, there was uh, something later on to where 1508, uh, which was the sister battalion, there they had an element. I mean, it was only 850 meters from Cop Johnston yeah. uh, on the main road. Yeah. And they kind of took things for granted. And there was a complex attack to where, you know, they used a donkey cart loaded with explosives, blew a hole in the wall, and then just inflowed guys with RPGs, I mean, AKs, uh, and suicide vests. So, I mean, you have people that are literally just kamikaze humans blowing themselves up. Wow. Coming at you. This is just, wow. The area and the things that happened out there, um, are just some of the worst things imaginable that 
how could a human decide to do that either to themselves or to one another is beyond me. Yeah. And they sit around and obviously plan this because these are complex attacks. Oh yeah. A lot of moving parts on that one. So it's like, okay, you're going to blow yourself up and you're going to come in with the AK 47. You're going to be here. I mean, it's almost like unimaginable. Well, and it was an inside job too, that particular one, because they, so the element that was there was, uh, they weren't, you know, it was more support guys. I think they had uh, some scouts with them, but the rest of them there, there was um, one in particular. I know there was a, a cook, you know, a chaplain's assistant. Oh, so these were people who had been working on the base. Yeah. Well, this was, they were had been with the headquarters element Yeah, and they were at, uh, I, I I don't remember if they called it the end cop. Everybody, we all referred to it as the old prison, Mm -hmm. you know, but it was, there was police there. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was, there was, there's two different, there was the NCD, there was two different police forces there, but just Afghan national police. Right. And they had been working. So, I mean, there was tents set up and everybody had thought they were getting rocketed because that's what happened at Kandahar. Yeah. You know, so they all went diving into the, in the bunker areas and that's the first thing the ones with the AKs and grenades went and cleared out. Yeah. They literally just, it was like fish in a barrel down there. Wow. That's a horrible incident. Absolutely horrible. Yeah. Yeah. As time goes on, you portray it very well in the book because there's, you know, more and more incidents. I think in one week you lose two guys to toe poppers and you start to develop this grim mentality where it's like guys almost like want to get yeah. blown up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not too serious. Yeah. They're like, I hope I get one of these instead of one of those, you know, and there is that, that grim mentality of like, it's going to happen. Yeah. Just a matter of when and how I just don't want it to be too bad. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. But it just shows you how, you know, when you're living under such extreme pressure, like you guys were and probably not getting great nutrition and not getting a lot of sleep. And just this unrelenting danger and seeing guys who you're hanging out with going down. And you even talk about a a couple guys like self-inflicted wounds, right? There's one guy who shoots himself and another guy from California who you said just sort of like disappears. Yeah. So they went on mid tour. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, he just, he left and never even came back. You know, it's just, (laughs) I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'll take whatever, uh, punishment the courts give me or whatever yeah it's not worth it going back there yeah and you know that other one where it was considered a um i don't know how a combat infantryman can have a malfunction while cleaning their weapon you know to where they blow their kneecap off right but yeah there's a lot of people that looked at that and they're like buddy like there's no way man like we know exactly yeah what happened yeah (laughs) wow and then right after christmas you go on leave That must have been a mind-blowing experience. Because you have to look at it. That was like maybe, it was only a few days after what had happened with with Specialist Johnston. Yeah. So, you know, here here this is, and I want to say I maybe went on one or two patrols after that, and then it was get your stuff ready, you're you're going home for (laughs) mid-tour. And... (laughs) I know I spent, I spent New Year's. And no counseling, no prep. You don't talk no to anybody. Nothing. Yeah. No nothing. I mean, and that, that was the most surprising thing was like, you would think that maybe in Kuwait, they would have somebody for that. Hey, look, you need yeah. a 24 hour just, or a 48 hour just to talk to. Yeah. Let's have a couple sessions here. Let's just talk, you know, deprogram a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, I ended up, you know, it was go home. And you're yeah, snowboarding. It was a little like bit snappy at some stuff, but days. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I went, well, I came home for a few days, and then yeah, exactly. I went into snowboarding and just ended up, um, you know, following that adrenaline. Yeah, and I guess you know, I mean, burning it at both ends because it, at that point, I'm already acclimated to the low sleep schedule. Yeah, you know, these <laughs> people that I ended up with partying out there were just like, this guy's a wild man. <laughs> of course, they love the war stories. You're on this sort of adrenaline cycle. There must be like a a physiological explanation of all this, but it's like when you're out in the field like that, you got to be hyper alert all the time. Yeah. Your adrenaline is probably always up, right? We have to look at cortisol levels. Yeah. 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 And then you go home and you're supposed to just kind of 
chill and snowboard and have a couple of beers, there's probably no way you can't, the human body probably can't make that kind of transition so quickly. Oh no, it was, it was a hundred percent. Like, you know, we we're full out black diamonds left and right. Like was, <laughs> we're not doing no bunny slope or we're right. doing, a, we're, we're doing going, the crazy stuff we're going because you want to keep yeah. that, that cortisol yeah, sure. level at the same, sure. you know, everything else feels boring. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's only for how long were you gone? Like a, a week or two or. So you're really gone a month because it takes you about a week to get back stateside. Okay. So, and then you have two weeks once you're there and then it takes another uh, week or so to get back in which I, I tactically missed my connecting flight in Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I spend one last night and I'm like, you know, I don't know if this is going to, but that layover. And who do you run into in the airport? This is a crazy coincidence. Yeah, I know. And this was wild. It was, uh, it was Dr. Grossman. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman is an internationally recognized scholar, author, soldier, and speaker who is one of the world's foremost experts in the field of human aggression and the roots of violence and violent crime. He's also a former West Point psychology professor, professor of military science, and an army ranger who has combined his experiences to become the founder of a new field of scientific endeavor, which he has termed killology. In this new field, Colonel Grossman has made important and new contributions to our understanding of killing in war, the psychological costs of war, the root causes of the current virus of violent crime, and the process of healing the victims of violence in war and peace. His books include On Killing, On Combat, and Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. A famous, I think he's a, a colonel or a lieutenant colonel. Or it was a lieutenant colonel. Wrote the book On Killing and, and the Psychological Effects. Yeah, and the craziest thing is, is he had spoken to this particular unit prior their their last deployment. So not this one. I didn't meet him. Yeah. But I didn't know who he was. So then when they asked me, you know, and I was like, I got this free meal in the airport from some retired They should describe the the circumstances in which you met him. Yeah. <laughs> and they, you know, I got slapped upside the head. They're like, that was freaking Dr. Grossman. You're like, you're kidding me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you're just sitting in the in the airport eating, right? And it sounds like you're ordering everything. Oh, I picked out the the best. If you go into the international terminal in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and it's still there because I looked at it before, you know, as I was writing the book, I was like, is this place still there? But there is like a four star sushi restaurant in the Ash international wow. terminal. Nice. And it's it's not cheap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's not cheap <laughs> because, you know, uh, I was in uniform, so I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. And the uh, waitress comes up and she says something and I'm like, oh, I'm not drinking. You know, they were like, this gentleman would like to cover your drinks. And I'm like, I'm not drinking. I'm in uniform and this and that. Yeah. And she leaves. I didn't really think of it. And then comes back over and is like, well, I guess that gentleman now wants to cover your meal. And it's yeah. like, does, does he understand how much it just like, oh, man. <laughs> This is like a hundred dollars. I just had to say bill. thanks. Yeah. Oh yeah. Easily. And it turned out to be Dr. Grossman. And it turned out to be Dr. Grossman. What are the odds, man? I know. I sent him a manuscript for this thing. I don't know uh -huh. if he's been over it just yet, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. That's very <laughs> cool. And then what's what's it like going back? It was trying to get it back into my head, like, hey, this is where you're going back to. Like, you need to, you need to get back into that mindset. Yeah. You know, and not come back. You know, because if you come back being lackadaisical and whatnot, the, the gravity of what you're dealing with out there and stuff, I, I knew immediately, you know, I was like, you, you have to have on your, you have to have it on right away. Yeah. Because if you don't, yeah, you know, you, you could be going back very shortly and not the way you want it to be. Right. And then over time, do you see an improvement? Does it get easier? Do you feel like you're getting more support from the villagers for a friendlier reception? Definitely a friendlier reception. It got to the point at one end to where they actually had invited us to stay in the mosque and run our patrols out of the mosque that night because they knew that it would be safe. And they were actually looking out 
on our safety end is they're like, they won't attack the mosque. Yeah. You know, use our mosque. And we're like, you know what? That's super nice. You like, now we want them to try to get us, but okay. You know, thanks. So we appreciate the offer. Um, but it was really a turn in that feeling, you know, and that they had towards us originally, like that standoffish, like who are these guys? Right. You know, or maybe even those looks of hatred to being, wow, these guys are actually putting their life and limb out there for us. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't seen this before uh, from that end. And then you actually do set up a fire base in the village. Yes. Um, well, there was a, that was just during a patrol. It was just a hasty, you know, a little patrol base. Mm -hmm. And that's the one to where um, we were talking before about the grenade getting thrown over the wall at us. Yeah. And thankfully it knocked off of one of the low overhanging trees at the last second, you know, because that would have been right where that guy was relieving himself at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, well, I've never seen, cause that was our squad leader and I've never seen anybody, uh, you know, pull their pants up and, and get into kit <laughs> as fast as I'd ever seen. Yeah. You know I mean? This was just like one smooth motion and like this, holy hell uh we're straight into it yeah because you're looking at the mad minute you know i mean this thing goes off and there's instant ak fire coming up out of the orchard wow and we have our machine gunner on the roof with a grade of deer up there and they were so close that he had to stand up and shoulder fire a 240 machine gun down into this orchard and he's getting you know splinters in his face yeah from the rounds and stuff zipping around him. And he thought that was it. You know, he just thought, yeah, I'll never like, survive. Th this, this is how I'm going out. Yeah. And, you know, blind firing and down into there. And then the great Adir picking up after he, you know, basically yelled down for permission. He's like, can I just start firing? You know, and it's, <laughs> yeah, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. He just starts launching out, you know, these, uh, these grenades. Wow. Did the uh, fire base stay there afterwards or was that? Uh, we ended up rolling up the, so we float in, we rolled those other guys up. Um, we, we didn't find any, hold on. I'm trying to think. Cause like, I'm, I just blurred two, two sections there. Yeah. There was those guys we didn't get. Yeah. I'm trying to think if we did end up staying, I think we ended up staying there through the night uh -huh. and running patrols out of there, but we did end up, and I want to say that this was coming back from this particular one as we ended up, we did end up, I have a picture of them because there was three guys that we rolled up uh -huh. and that were suspected, you know, Taliban and we brought them back and held them. And then there was villagers that came out. Like it was just the fact of they, they needed somebody to have control of these people because they came out signing waivers of like, Hey, these people you know, or affidavits, you know, these people are Taliban. They're bad guys. They're bad people. They're an issue. And, you know, yeah. And they all, and somebody came and picked them up and off they went. Uh-huh. Wow. And was that the only time you captured uh, Taliban or, or were there other instances? Yeah, that was the only time we actually had, had guys back with us. And you also talk about in the book, the Afghan sort of view of death. You have an, you talk about an incident where a, a, a boy is you know collateral damage to one of these attacks yeah can you talk about that for a minute that's when things started getting things got really bad only because of you know these villagers and stuff started started trusting us so therefore the enemy stopped telling them where they were putting landmines yeah you know and this is when there was tripwires and stuff out in the fields and some of the kids were playing out there and one of them ended up hitting one and so you have this um grandfather coming in with his child who's bleeding out yeah and looking for our help to where we're trying to get air assets in to get him out to the the field hospitals at kandahar yeah and they they couldn't spare the air assets and it was essentially a death sentence you know and, and telling this grandfather you know hey, we're sorry we've done all we can do here and your best bet is to try and make this you know make it to the local hospital down in Kandahar yourself, yeah. you know, and, you know, he picked up this kid in his arms and, and, you know, looks at us and says, inshallah, you know, which is, you know, it's, if it's God's will. Yeah. 
And, you know, just seeing him walk off into the distance, carrying this kid, Wow! you know, you, you knew, you knew that the kid was, was gone. Wow. And without anger. If there was anger, it wasn't based towards us. It was more of just this, the sadness. Yeah. You know, can you just kind of talk about the last couple of months and then what it was like to leave? Yeah. Because I know you, when you get to Kandahar, you do (laughs) an interesting thing. You go to, to thank the squads that come in and rescue people (laughs) and they're not, there's no, they're not there. They've left. Well, yeah, they've left. Um, That was, so the last few months, you know, I know that at some point within there, I kind of came across my own thoughts of, you know, you're probably not making it out of here. Yeah. You know, and you had to face that because the fact of getting in your own head about, about all of this, Yeah, you know, the odds weren't looking good. As I said before, the, the casualty rates, it was really a lot of times it was thinking, you started thinking to yourself, who's it going to be next? You know? Yeah. Am I, and you really started getting into your head to the point to where it wasn't productive. It was more of a, you were going to be more of a, a detriment out there. Yeah. And I had to finally say, you know what? It doesn't matter. Like you're here right now. Yeah. Do the best that you can with the time that you have and enjoy every moment. Yeah. And it's really taking that forward and realizing that. And then using that too as a, as a temperature gauge in life, you know, if you're starting to feel down about something and whatnot, you're like, Hey man, look, this is just a low point. You just need to get through this. Does that stuff really matter? Yeah. You know, yeah. Go for it. Live, live life. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't matter. You know, eventually your time will be up. Right. And if it is, it it doesn't matter. Exactly. Right. Right. So it's kind of like a live in the moment type of thing, which which is, it's a kind of a horrible circumstance in which to realize that, but not a bad realization in life in general. No, so many people go through life not looking at anything that way. And they're always either bound by fear, you know, of not making it or what's that next moment going to bring. Right. And they, they kind of tie themselves from moving on past that and, and from what they can do as their own ability. You know, they, they never rise to who they could be because they have that fear that holds them back. Right, absolutely. But I know you were saying in moving forward with stopping by in Kandahar, you know, and, and asking, you know, hey, where's the, where's the PJs and stuff? So these guys had been unbelievable. I mean, we're talking any, any call that we put out for a medevac and these guys showed up, it was usually within 10 to 15 minutes of our call. Like it was just wow. the speed... Yeah. At which they showed up, yeah. you know, we wouldn't have been able to do as good of a job without them for sure. We would have had the, it would have been even worse. Sure. You know, out there otherwise. Sure. So it was just a, you know, let's, uh, let's go say th- thanks you know, face to face here. Yeah. Yeah. And going down there and getting this answer of, you know, all these, they're not here anymore, but it was a, a strange feel to it. And I actually didn't understand it until much later when I was writing this. Yeah. And I started researching the Pedro air crews that I had found out that one of the, one of the air crews that had been taking our guys out, Pedro 66 had actually gone down that summer. Oh, I see. Yeah. They had been shot down. I mean, and just expanding on how many more, you know, people from the ODAs that were lost and from task force that were lost and like the expansion of how many people either were taken by suicide or taken you know, throughout the years when they stayed in during their career, yeah. you know, or even during that deployment is just mind blowing when you start pulling all of it apart and seeing all of this. And that's exactly what had happened. It, it, that's why I had that response that I did down there is they were like, Oh, he, he doesn't know, but I don't think they wanted to put that on me either right then and there. Right. Cause they knew where we had come from. They don't want to tell you they were dead. They just were like, they're not here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that's a pretty dramatic moment. And then what was it like coming back? Because you were planning to continue your career in the military, and you did, correct? Yeah, where a lot of guys did not. So what was that like for you? For me, I mean, so like one of the, one of the stories, one of the last instances that happened within that unit before leaving was we got back and normally they'll give you know, a term of block leave, which is like a month or so Mm -hmm. to where these guys can go decompress and whatnot. And at that point they had already known, you know, DOD and whatnot and army had already known we were going to come back 
being pretty tight, pretty wound up with everything. Yeah. So. Because you had, I, I think you say in the book, like a 46% casualty rate at one point. 52. 52. Yeah. Wow. 52. Yeah. I, at one point, the entire prosthetics word at Walter Reed was full of our guys. God. Like that was, it was nobody else other than two Fury on there. It was insane. Wow. Uh, that's a horrible statistic. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So we were held back for two weeks or so. You know, I can't remember what admin excuse they gave and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But we're back for first formation. Everybody's, you know, dress right, dress in the ranks. Yeah. And first sergeant at the front. And nobody had told us that they had a new tradition on Fort Bragg of firing off the morning cannon to start the day. Yeah. And sure enough, boom. And the entire group of like hardened, you know, military in ranks. Battle ready guys. Yeah. Hit the deck. Yeah. You know, I mean, just straight hit the deck. And it was just this nervous giggle from the first sergeant afterwards in front of us. And he's like, well, uh, I think there's some lingering PTSD much, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And just a normal reaction. But those experiences in the Argandab, I mean, really... They translated in going forward to where a lot of the rest of the stuff in my military career, it, you know, it was, you know, I went forward and I did SFAS next, which was special forces assessment selection. And that was easy at that point, just due to perspective. Sure. And, you know, it's still a tough task. Yeah. But perspective wise, I'm like, man, this is cake. I can do this all day long. I'm not, I don't have to worry about where I step. Yeah. Oh, you would still, I still find myself occasionally. Really? Glancing down and looking and scanning and then realizing you're not in that anymore, bud. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant Allen Thomas. Thomas, yes. Talk about him for a minute. He was my initial squad leader when I first got there. And I know that, you know, with that suicide bomber that had gone off and he was one of the casualties at that point, um, he actually flatlined on the, on the bird when they finally got him out of there. Wow. Um, and they brought him back on the way to Germany. Yeah. He ended up getting separated from the military mm -hmm. due to, you know, his injuries, uh, lung capacity. And you know, I mean, really he just couldn't get around uh, like he used to. Yeah. That leaves a mark there. And I know that there was a, a point to where, you know, he was seeking help. He was seeking help from the VA. Mm -hmm. He was like, things were really getting to him. I know that I came across him at this point, I was in the Special Forces qualifi qualification course, the Q, as they say. Yeah. And I'd seen him in the gym and he just, he had looked like a hollow person, you know, compared to, he just wasn't, I didn't know him well enough other than like, hey, is this just because he's not in a leadership capacity? Right. You know, we weren't close in that way. Yeah. And I kind of just took for granted that there was other people that were around that were close to him that he must have still been in touch with, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't too much more long after that to where, you know, we got the news that he had committed suicide, Wow, you know, and it wasn't, wasn't just a committed suicide. I mean, it was, he had been seeking an inpatient facility and they were, they told, they turned him away. You know, there's not enough beds. We can't see you. Yeah. And it was that weekend to where, you know, he got in a firefight with some of his neighbors. Yeah. And he essentially, they said that he had a, a flashback, you know, and cleared the house that was directly next to them, killed the neighbors that were in there and, Jeez. you know, ended up realizing what he had done and, and shooting himself. Oh my God. Ending his own life in the street afterwards. Oh my God. That's awful. And he had been a, a sergeant. He had been like a, a leader. Yeah. He was a squad leader. Yeah. He was a, a, a heck of a, of an NCO. I mean, really, you can't talk about that particular unit and, and definitely not first platoon without talking about Sergeant Thomas. I mean, he, he was a character, but he was also somebody that he was one of the guys that he could always make us laugh. You know, it was, there was always a, you know, he was a good soldier. Wow. How tragic, how tragic. And, you know, to wrap this up, can you talk a little bit about the experience of writing the book, you know, and how it kind of brought everybody, you know, back together again and, created this support group and how you've extended this in your career. So talking with, you know, the families of, uh, specialist Jason Johnston and, and, you know, staff Sergeant Brunkhorst and, uh, specialist Karen. Yeah. That was especially Johnston. I'm, 
they were really easy to talk to, but then just their answer blew me away on, you know, when I asked that, you know, this particular soldier's mom, you know, about, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be talking about your son in here, but this involves the point to when, uh, you know, when he was killed in combat. Yeah. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts were like, how far exactly, cause I want to stay respectful to your son, but I also want people to know what happened. And I know you do too, Yeah. but I'm kind of riding this line. I've never done anything like this before. And her answer just, it blew me away because she asked me, she's like, well, does Josh know? And it, that was uh, a certain Leeson, one of his friends that was out there as well. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, Josh, Josh is aware. That's actually how I got your information. And she literally just goes to me. She's like, you know what? That's good enough for me. If Josh says that that falls under respectful and that end of things. And, you know, from a soldier's point of view, like you have my blessing. And I was just wow, so taken back by that. And to have that trust. Yeah. It was, it's been an experience. I've learned so much through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's been just such a good thing overall. It just seems like a natural part of healing or a necessary part of healing to just talk about what people went through because everybody sort of shares the trauma, you know, and they kind of keep it to themselves and just to be able to, to talk and go, you know, wow, that really affected me and how it affected you and so on. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the biggest really is getting guys to open up that this is okay. You know, yeah. during this process, getting in touch with these guys yeah, and making sure that we had this accurate picture of everything, you know, once it was, once it was understood what the goal was, it wasn't some sort of, you know, glory seeking narrative and it wasn't pointing into any one person, yeah. you know, but try to be a true representation of, you know, what happens out there. Right. Right. Um, you had so many guys that, had so self isolated for so long that mm -hmm. after we had talked, you know, one in particular that I'm thinking of right now is, you know, he was like, man, I, I was really dreading that this, this call, hmm. but after talking with you and everything, and just, I feel like a weight's been lifted and this has, you know, truly been really good for me. I haven't talked about any of this in so long. And I think that's where my fears lied. Yeah, sure. But after opening up about it with you and after, I mean, this was a good three, four hours, this, this particular person, mm -hmm. he had just, you could tell, you could yeah. tell that he just was so happy to actually open up and talk to one of the guys that had been there because he had felt like, you know, he had bottled this stuff up for so long. Sure. And others along the way, I mean, other people have reached out that were in units beforehand, as well as one of the most exciting things is I talk about in the book, the guys from to Charlie. Uh, so Charlie company, second platoon, they were our, our sister company in that battalion are across the river, getting a very different type of, uh, you know, contact going on over there was, there's was more gunfights and more kinetic. Yeah. And, uh, to take their story and matter of fact, just this last weekend, they, had a deal offered from this particular uh, publisher. So is getting that end of the story out as well. Oh, you know, and now it's becoming yeah. very solidified for them and, and other people as well. It's just been, yeah, it's so good to share that end of things. Well, and also I think it's good to tell these stories to people who are not in the military so that everybody gets a sense of what modern warfare is like. Hey, this is what happened behind it. Yeah, the media doesn't like to talk about that end or what the army has kind of allowed the media to talk about right. um, in there. You know, where was their focus? I think there's one NBC clip, you know, that's out there from uh, Bill Neely when he came up. But I mean, you're talking a, a minute and a half soundbite that was created for, you know, one night on NBC. Yeah. Uh, as a, and it was really due to the fact that our battalion command was removed and then you had uh general mccrystal was removed from theater at that time as well mm -hmm. and that's really where the focus was it wasn't about our you know 50 plus percent casualty rate and right. it wasn't about what was happening to the guys on the ground right. that was the story about uh general mccrystal being removed because of the article and rolling stone not about 
the troops on the ground, right? So yeah, yeah, and the Kandahar surge and just how much happened throughout that. It wild. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of this really just goes along with one of the efforts that I talk about in the book that there was a something called Operation Resiliency to where they brought a lot of the guys from this particular unit uh, back to Charlotte, North Carolina for an event that was, you know, it was kind of a, it was a mix of things. It was a, it was a hybrid one. It was the first of its kind. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was the pilot program for this and it was done in conjunction with the VA, Mm -hmm. but it was getting these guys back in a peer to peer capacity to where they all came down to Charlotte and there was a few different, you know, uh, team building type things and icebreakers in order to get these guys talking in. But quite honestly, it was almost like being back together again. Yeah. Uh, you know, you put somebody through a traumatic event like that and stuff, there's always going to be this bond between one another. Absolutely. Sure. And in speaking with any of them, you know, it's like, it's like you never left. Yeah. You know, you could just, that bond still exists. You're still right there. Yeah. And you know, it just went to where a lot of these guys, and especially even that weekend, it was good for them to where one of them opened up and said that he had been, in fact, thinking of of killing himself when he got the news of this particular yeah. uh, retreat. And he was like, it would be great to see guys one last time before I go. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And this whole thing changed his outlook. You know, I mean, he's now involved in the system in, in getting people the, you know, the help that they need in there. Yeah. Um, And really that's been the focus of this too, is, you know, where there was some rifts and stuff within the guys that were there. Uh, This is really, it's gotten them talking again. Mm -hmm. It's gotten the guys within first platoon really discussing this stuff with one another, with myself, opening up about it yeah, and revisiting that end, but revisiting it together instead of being isolated. And it's been good for so many of them. Good so much so to where it's been, part of the project with this, like, you know, I mean, the website for the book has a, a wall of stories on it to where I encourage other people, like send me stuff in, I'll share it. Yeah. You know, while eyes are on, I will, I have no problem sharing your stuff out there because, you know, you need to be heard. At the end of your book, you talk about sort of community through battle, like, you know, kind of forged a community with these guys and how important that is and how the realization, you know, we need to extend that throughout our whole society today because we're so separate. Absolutely. People think they're connected through the internet or social media, but it's just not the same as, you know, getting together, hanging out, no. telling stories and finding commonality and, uh, you know, just kind of human commonality. And God, we're, we're, you know, our society cries out for that. It does. It, I mean, we're built as humans, like, yeah. To do that. We literally, you know, there was an instance to where I was doing stuff and writing stuff and was like wondering why this particular person was putting, he put himself into the actions of somebody else on the battlefield, but he like would never lie about this end. And I'm trying to figure out what was happening there. And in talking to a psychologist, finding that this stuff is that he's like, this is not the first time you see this type of thing right is that humans in these traumatic and high stress type combat situations they actually sync up yeah you know which makes so much sense when you start looking at how these patrols move or how you're reacting to contact right you're watching one another all the time you're following in one another's footsteps yeah you're looking at the expression on the guy in front of you if he senses danger or whatever to the fact of like if it's pitched pitch black, dark at night, you know, I mean, you can't see that great through night vision, but you can anticipate who somebody is because of the way they move, like in an instant, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, it's crazy yeah, to get to that level. But with what you were saying with the community aspect and everything, at, at one point or another within a military career, everyone has seen what leadership looks like. Yeah you know, what right leadership looks like. I'm not saying that's your whole career. You know, it might have just been a snippet. Right. But in the type of world that we live in right now and the lack of leadership that's out there and the lack of community, Mm -hmm. you know, you might be the standard, you know, and that might just take something as small as, you know, coaching your daughter's soccer team or something, stepping up. Right. And being someone that will do that 
in the community and being that base. As Will points out, no one who served in the Argandab River Valley during the Afghan war left unchanged. They saw the real face of war, and as Will says, they don't wish that hell on anyone. If there's one piece of wisdom he gained from his experience that he thinks may be of help to others, it's this. Don't panic, slow down, measure your actions, and look for the way out as you fall back on your resilience to just keep moving forward. As for the men he served with, Will says, and I quote, when it comes down to it, we are truly there for each other no matter what. That's the type of brotherhood that's forged from a struggle like the one we faced in the valley, and one that I'll always cherish being a part of, no matter how any of us shake out. Today, Will runs a marketing company called No Limits Marketing Group, and is a founding board member of a veteran nonprofit organization called Rally the Troops, which is now part of Racing for Heroes. We thank him for his service and his honest and powerful book, Damn the Valley. It's my great honor to name William Yeski as today's hero behind the headlines. Heroes Behind Headlines. Executive producer, Ralph Pizzullo. Produced and engineered by Mike Dawson. Music provided by Extreme Music. For exclusive content, please join our Patreon group at patreon.com slash heroes behind headlines.